Because I really believe in the spirit around that where we're moving prophetically, that God is growing up the prophetic, that he is maturing the prophetic. And it's not going to be just about somebody giving a word or somebody receiving a word. God's going to really have mm -hmm. us map this thing out. Like what is going on in the natural? What is going on in the spiritual? What has happened historically in regions like that? And I think it's going to be more crucial that we know how to go in and map out regions, especially where God um, has given us influence. So I know like the areas that where I feel like God is, is um, moving on me or opening up influence for me, definitely California where I live, but of course, Atlanta, um, Texas area and Oklahoma. I feel like God is opening up avenues of ministry there for me. So I just kind of go in and map out the land and see who's there and then meet with people that already follow me. Because after we've come out of this whole election thing and what looked like a, a debacle and all this kind of stuff, God is making us grow up in the prophetic. And I think that's going to be important and crucial as we move forward in it to help people what, because most people really don't understand what the prophetic is about. And they don't understand the warfare that comes with the prophetic. Not you, not you just not only just receiving a personal word, but maybe receiving a word for a region or a city or a state or a country, that there is great warfare that comes with that. That's why Paul told Timothy concerning his call that you make sure that you war a good warfare with the prophetic word that has been spoken to you. A lot of people don't understand. And when you get a prophetic word, I was taught that that's time to brace yourself because God's giving you a prophetic word. The Bible says that the prophetic is un the prophetic word is unto the dark day that God gives you a word because an attack is coming and you're going to need to hold on to something while you weather the attack. And a lot of people think the prophetic is, you know, so they can advance, so they can, um, get a promotion so they can start a company so God can bless them. That is like elementary when it comes to the prophetic. God is about moving nations and cities and regions and um, establishing a work in, in areas. And so I really believe that, that I really know that God is, is, he's growing us up in this prophetic. And it's important to know, you know, what does that look like as we move forward? here. So before I start talking about, you know, warfare and stuff, I want to remind us that Colossians 2.15 says, and having disarmed the powers, talking about Jesus and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross, that as we move into spiritual warfare, no matter what the battle is, Jesus has already won the war. He disarmed them, he made a public spectacle of them and he triumphed over them on the cross that we we are going and we've heard this so much in Christian Christendom that we are in a fixed fight and we are in a fixed fight. There's just sometimes <clears throat> things may take longer to manifest because sometimes God wants to grow you up. Sometimes he wants to um, strengthen the weapons of your warfare. He wants to teach you something new. If every battle was easy, then we wouldn't learn that much. We, we're just, we're expecting things like America, we're just expecting things to happen right now, you know, because we're in a controlled environment in a lot of ways. Our government is set, our economy is set. We know how things work <coughs> and we expect things just to happen the way it, it has always happened. But there are gonna be some things in the natural as we move forward that we're gonna have to contend with and contend for. So the elements of spiritual warfare, when we're looking at spiritual warfare, it is body, soul, and spirit. All three have to be in synergistic motion and they all have to be in agreement. When you're in it, you cannot be um, split, double-minded. The Bible says, do not be double-minded. When, when you are preparing yourself to go into warfare, your body, take care of your body, take exercise, eat right, Yvonne, cut the sugar, you know, we have to take care of ourselves physically. 
you know, go to the doctor, do the things you need to do naturally. Because I, I believe that some sicknesses or disease, I believe 90% of them are emotional. Like there's something mentally going on with us that is opening a door for the enemy to attack our body. But sometimes we can open up, you know, diet and all that kind of stuff. We can open ourselves up to sickness and disease by not caring for the body. And of course, the soul, we've moved into an area of ministry where there's a lot of talk and engagement about mental health. Because, you know, back in the day in church, you know, if you just shouted, and I believe that still works, but if you shouted and, and got slain in the spirit and somebody laid hands on you, you could get free. But there are some elements and some people that actually need mental health care. Because mental health care is not about somebody diagnosing you as much as it is about somebody giving you a strategy. Because as we learned, you know, previously in the training, that spiritual warfare is 95% psychological that satan is a master of psychological warfare and if anything happens in your life it manifested in your mind first and so we definitely have to take care of our mental health and care for our soul because that word soul is the word suke which means mind you know, our mind, will, and our emotions, and we have to care for ourselves. You have to know when you're tired. I read a quote that said, self-care is not a warm cup of coffee and a, and a hot bath. Self-care is creating a life that you don't have, that you don't have to keep recovering from. And so some of that is setting healthy boundaries. You know, the worst, um, Lester Summerall said that the worst thing that can happen to you and the best thing that can happen to you is a person coming into your life. And as prophetic people, we have to be very, very careful about who we allow to come into our lives, especially in a ministry setting. We have to be very careful because people will pull on that prophetic gift and, and drain you dry if you let them. And then if you're if you're still dealing with, you know, levels of guilt or I got to, you know, serve them because Christ says that we serve them and that type of thing that, you know, fights false ideologies about how much we're supposed to serve. Your um, self-care is your ethical responsibility. As a prophet, you have to take care of yourself. You have to guard yourself. You have to set healthy boundaries of your, uh, around your life. And the next thing is spirit. We know that, that we are, we are fighting a spiritual battle. <clears throat> the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So we have to make sure that our spirit, soul, and body, that we are fully intact, you know, and I try to listen to the Holy Spirit about, you know, things concerning my health. What do I need to do? Because I've already made a pact with God that I'm not dying sick. I'm dying empty. There is no place in the Bible that says we have to die sick. We die because we're finished. Like I love the story of Smith Wigglesworth when God said, okay, Smith, it's time to go home. He's like, okay, well, let me go say bye to my friends first. He went and he said by his friend, sat in a chair and his spirit went, left his body and he went on to be with the Lord. We don't have to die sick and crippled. And I was watching a, a prophet today and he was talking about how God, you know, everything that has been happening in this, this nation, that God is releasing a, a healing anointing over the body of Christ to get rid of cancer and all these debilitating sicknesses and diseases because they are not the will of the Father. Even concerning COVID-19, God showed me a passage in Job where the sons of God came to visit. The sons of God were in divine counsel with the Lord and Satan showed up and God said, what are you doing here? And he said, I'm running. I've been roaming to and fro looking for somebody. He's looking for someone that he can make a case against. And, and God started teaching me whatever you see the enemy trying to do. I, that's because I'm doing the opposite and that the enemy is trying to counteract what he sees coming. COVID-19 released a spirit of fear over this nation and sickness and disease and people were dying. That's because God, the, God is stirring the healing wells again. God is releasing a healing anointing like unlike anything we've ever seen. Cancer is going to drop off people's bodies. Diabetes is going to leave people's bodies. People are going to be immediately in their right mind. The Bible says because mental illness, some I would say the bulk of mental illness is caused by a demonic spirit because when Jesus cast the demon out of um, that young boy, the legion, the Bible says immediately he was in his right mind. 
And so as, as prophets, we have to be on guard. We have to be on standby and be able to respond at a moment's notice because many prophets operate in the realm of healing, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical. And so we have to be ready for the coming revival. So preparation for warfare, what does that look like? The first one is, um, I want to read this. It says, you know, that as in any battle, there will be losses. So we have to understand that. But Revelations 2, 8 through 11 teaches us that there will be casualties as the gospel advances in a people group. We see that in Acts 16. Um, Paul and Silas were beaten in jail for delivering the slave girl from the spirit of divination. And 2 Corinthians um, makes a list of hardships that um, Paul endured for advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So there will be some casualties. There will be some backlash from the enemy. I was listening to a prophet that was um, who grew up on, um, his father was a missionary. He grew up on the mission field. And he said he was, he was set in an Indian reservation where these people were operating all levels of witchcraft, shamans and stuff. And he said his father woke up one night and the, the church where they used to worship the devil at was in the middle of the street in front of the house. The whole building had moved and was sitting in front of the house. And he said, because we didn't understand stuff like that, his father died young at 38 because he didn't understand warfare and witchcraft and stuff like that. And even with the election, I tell people is that there was a lot of witchcraft happening, happening during the, the election. There were witches that had, you know, um, the president at the time, the, the president was their assignment. So anytime you see an advancement in spiritual warfare, that's because God is about to do something so significant that the enemy wants to stop, try to stop what God is doing. And we see that throughout the scriptures, even when Jesus was being born, you know, um, Herod was trying to kill all the babies under two, under two years old. And God told Joseph, I need you to take Jesus for, to Egypt for a couple of years, a few years until Herod dies. And so there's, Satan is going to always try to, try to interfere with what God is doing in the earth. And so as we prepare for warfare, there's some elements, whether it's cosmic warfare, I'll go back and, and kind of talk about that again. This is what my pastor taught me. There's ground level warfare where we're just you know, it's pretty much hand-to-hand -hand combat where we're in the engagement of defeat of demons that are influencing individuals. Usually people have been opened up to this level of warfare or it's um, inherited or they, they've they um, opened themselves up through witchcraft, Ouija boards, you know, some type of occultic activity. Then you have occult level spiritual warfare is where you're dealing with organized witchcraft operating through people who oppose God. So these are people that are organized. And the next level is cosmic warfare, where we're, we're, we're looking to um, remove demonic powers and spirits that have entrenched themselves in regions and in areas. You know, like we see in Atlanta, there's a, there's a, a perverse, not a perverse spirit, that there's an unclean spirit that hovers over that region and it manifests itself in homosexuality. But a lot of that, and, it, and people can be drawn to this region. It's the same thing that has happened in San Francisco. People can be drawn to these regions. Some, I, I believe a lot of this thing is, you know, abandonment and rejection from a father figure or a mother figure or unforgiveness towards a parent of that same sex. Because God had to clear something up for me concerning this whole homosexual um, agenda because some people want to be delivered. They, do, they just don't know that yet. And God can heal them. And God will show me there's a difference between people that are struggling with homosexuality and LGBTQ. LGBTQ is a political agenda. And their agenda is to push the agenda and put it in our schools and, and attack our churches. They have a political agenda when it's different than somebody that's struggling or has been opened up to that through molestation or something like that. Those are two different things. And those people we love and we minister to when they're open for, you know, to be ministered to. There was a pastor, he said his son had fallen into um, homosexuality for many, many years, but he didn't know that he was molested at eight years old. And that spirit broke. But political and religious spirits, sometimes they operate together. They move in synergy together. And that's why you see a lot of politics in the church. 
because it's a political spirit. And it's a political and religious spirit is the few trying to control the many. And so when we're looking at preparation for spiritual warfare, the first one is personal holiness. First Peter 1.15 says, but as he who called you, called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Colossians 3, 5 says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in your sec in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Our alignment with, we have to be in alignment with God in every single area of our lives is necessary if we are to engage in spiritual warfare, you know, and that is why we have the covenant of 1 John 1 and 9. God is never after perfection. He just wants those that have a, a willing heart and a made up mind to bear fruit that's worthy of repentance because sometimes things things that have happened to you as a child can open you up to things that you can struggle with your whole life being molested as a child opened me up to a spirit of lust and and i've had to fight that thing my whole life you know because i was opened up to that and so, but God just wants us to desire, have a desire to be holy and to be righteous and that we live a sanctified life. You can struggle with something without yielding to that thing. And so God, and so before, as we're entering into warfare, you gotta be, you don't wanna give, the Bible says give no room to the devil. Don't give the devil any, any foothold in your life. And that's why the Bible says that we should be quick to repent. That like, you have to be quick. Don't sit on stuff. If you say something you shouldn't say, if you go somewhere you should, whatever it is, be quick to repent because you don't want to give any room to the enemy. God, if God gave us first John one and nine, cause he knew we wouldn't be perfect. He knew we would make mistakes. He knew we will miss the mark, but post personal holy holiness is absolutely required, especially in the prophetic ministry because prophetic people can struggle a lot with sexual sins. And I see this a lot in ministry and in ministering to people. That is a spirit, that Jezebelic spirit that can, can um, really take down a prophet. That's why in the book of Revelations, it talks about how the, I believe it was the church of Thyatira where they say you suffered that spirit, Je that prophetess Jezebel, and she led all the men into sexual immorality. So that is a spirit. I believe a lot of the people struggling with homosexuality may are a lot of them are prophetic. And Satan's job with prophetic people is to always silence their voice. The next thing is fasting and prayer. Uh, Matthew 17, 21, it says, however, this kind does not go out um, except by prayer and fasting. Fasting is a voluntary weakness and humility that seeks grace from God to accomplish the task, connect with God in prayer or voluntary hu humility for repentance. The Bible says that, that I wanted, there's a passage in Isaiah that it would um, destroy the yoke of bondage. Fasting destroys the yoke of bondage. And then it says that your healing will break forth like the noonday. Fasting and prayer is for you to maintain a life of holiness and righteousness, to have your ears circumcised to the things of God. Um, that, is, that is the next step for personal holiness is living a life of fasting and prayer. And fasting can be as God calls you, or you can have a set day or whatever, but we have to stay in prayer concerning our just personal lives. I, I know sometimes many people in ministry, they forget about taking care of themselves and they just wanna take care of the ministry. That's why I believe we've seen a huge influx in, in this decade of pastors committing suicide because they've exhausted them, themselves emotionally. Everybody needs a vacation. Everybody needs to take time off. So I want you to be very careful. I want you guys to be very diligent about your mental health and your, your quiet time and your own personal prayer. Do things that are that bring you pleasure, hiking, reading, you know, watching a funny movie, whatever it is, make sure that you do that for yourself because it's so necessary because sometimes the warfare can be so heavy. Like I know when God moved me into this space um, to pray for the election and all the stuff that was going on, it was such a heavy weight on me that that was all I could do pretty much all day for three months is pray. 
but I had to, when, when I felt that thing lifting, then I started, you know, I like to watch, you know, little um, movies and comedies and stuff on Netflix. And so I had to bring myself back to a baseline where I could do some things that were enjoyable to me. Cause that's so necessary for you to be effective in ministry. There was a prophet, I don't know what his name was, but it was, um, I heard about him in the sixties. All he would do was prophesy to people all day long. They would come to his house, stand in a line, and he would just prophesy to them. And he wore himself out because we have to, we can't treat prophecy like it's fortune telling, or it is like you're doing a psychic reading or somebody's reading their horoscope. That is not what prophecy is about. Prophecy is about advancing the agenda of God. And sometimes people rather than seeking God's face for themselves or spending or disciplining themselves in prayer and fasting, they'll want to come to a prophet and get a word so they don't have to do the work themselves. But like I said, I believe God is growing the church up from that. And, and the prophets that God connects with churches or, or sets in churches, they're really going to be used by the Lord to move the ministry forward, not just individual people. The next element of um, spiritual warfare preparation <clears throat> is prayer, praise, and worship. And so that is the fasting and prayer is horizontal. That's you preparing yourself. Prayer, praise, and worship is vertical. That is us spending time in the presence of God and getting God's mind, God's heart concerning a matter, concerning a region, concerning um, his, his, what he wants to see happen in a specific area. And so we spend time in prayer and praise and worship. And I want to add to that the word of God. As a prophet, you have to know the word of God. You can't, we cannot prophesy separate and apart from God's word. Because the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. If God did it before, he'll do it again. We can find every situation and circumstance in the Bible where God moved on a person, moved on a people group, moved on a region. To, to establish his will. And we can still see that happening today. And so we have to be students of the Bible. And I know when we first talked about, you know, the prophetic is, you know, I hope you guys have taken the time to do your um, statement of faith. What is it that you actually, actually believe? What scriptures are you standing on concerning your ministry? Like one of the scriptures that I stand on is in the book of Joel chapter two, let the priest that minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and asking, asking God to spare the people. And then their healing will break forth. And so part of my ministry is to minister to leaders, prophetic leaders. The next thing is to can, um, so, so prayer, praise, and worship is our, our entry into a supernatural dialogue with God. Prayer contains the multi-dimensional ways that every Christian experience closeness and union with the Lord. Having a rich prayer life is necessary for effective spiritual warfare. I love the story of Reese Howe. He was a intercessor. He was a prophetic intercessor during World War II. And he would get supernatural download from God and give it to the military so that they could be strategic in natural warfare, hand-to-hand -hand combat in the natural, but they were getting supernatural instruction from a prophetic intercessor. God was showing them what to do. And so that's why it's so important to have these, this element of where we're spending time with God and, and just listening for his heart. God, what are you doing? I asked God, you know, when I'm on a prayer assignment, God, what am I, when a certain element of the, of the battle lifts, I ask God, what am I praying for now? What's my next assignment in this assignment? The next thing is, is repentance and personal, personal healing. Any area of brokenness, offense, and unforgiveness are major stumbling blocks to successful high level spiritual warfare. I want to say that again any area of brokenness, if there's any childhood trauma, get the, get the help you need to be able to start moving in a place of wholeness. Um, offense, if you're, har if you're, if you're wounded or, or harboring bitterness towards somebody and unforgiveness, those are major stumbling blocks and they are major openings for the enemy to defeat you in battle. Unforgiveness is probably, I would say the number one, the number one thing is unforgiveness. Satan will traffic, will always traffic in areas of 
darkness. Seek to be free from any of these things and seek to be free from habitual sin before attempting any type of spiritual warfare. And that is so important that we take that time, pull back. But it's all, you always need a retreat before you advance. Pull back and ask God, what do I need to do? Well, there was a time in my life just because of being molested and being abused and having an abusive stepfather and being abandoned by my own natural father and all that stuff going on. I had to, I submitted for a couple of years. I didn't even really do ministry. I submitted for a couple of years to a, a therapist that used to be a pastor, but moved into um, ministering to and, and walking people in ministry through, you know, childhood trauma and wounds like that. For two years, I submitted to him. No, a year and a half, I submitted to him. And we worked through a lot of stuff. And, and there are times that I would get stuck over the years and I would I still call him and, and he would walk me through it. But I knew that I needed to do that for myself because I kept repeating these same cycles over and over again. And, and cycles, negative cycles are the way that the enemy keeps you entrenched in sin. And so I had to deal with these situations in my life so I could heal and move on and become the person that God wanted me to be because none, none of us are exempt. None of us are exempt from anything. We are all, I tell people all the time, we are mere mortals. It's the willful things that disappoint God. The next thing is confirm your calling. Confirm your calling. The Bible says make your calling and your election sure that usually when you're prophetic, God has already ministered that to you and you see the the elements and the the nature of the call on your life whether it's through dreams and visions um or you just know stuff you should know i know when i was a child i had deja vu like crazy i think my whole young life maybe from eight to to my late teens i always had deja vu i always had this feeling that i had been there before and that was a that was my prophetic gift starting to you know come alive or, or started activating in me. So confirm your calling. And then there are people in my life that confirm my call. Like my pastor, he said, he told me, he said, Yvonne, you are, I am your business card. I can vouch for your integrity. I can vouch for your holiness. I can vouch for your anointing. So you need somebody that can vouch for you. I know sometimes it's difficult. And I'm going to touch on something that God has given me to do. I know that it's difficult sometimes when you don't have a church setting, because sometimes a the church right now is one of the worst places for a prophet to be. They do, a lot of churches don't recognize the prophetic gift. And if they do, they, they try to suppress you in that gift because they're, they feel threatened. And I talk to so many people, and I just know from my own experience, but I talk to so many people that struggle with that. And especially women, especially for women, female prophets that there's not a lot of recognition out there. And so um, my pastor and I have been talking, he, he flows in the apostolic too, and he has a very heavy burden for women, prophetic women in ministry. And so we're talking about, um, we're gonna set up a, a apostolic and prophetic women's alliance for people that don't have covering because it's so important to have a level of covering. You don't wanna just be out there on your own and not have somebody that can be praying for you, vouch for you, open up resources and regions and territories for you. That's important. And, and I feel like because we're moving into this Esther and Deborah um, momentum in this hour, that there are so many people that are not covered and they wanna be covered and they need to be covered and they want accountability and they want somebody that can come and talk to. So definitely working on that because I know how it was for me. I just was, because I wasn't raised in church, I was just too ignorant to know that I was doing something wrong, you know, according to religious activity. You know, I thought, hey, God showed me this, so I might as well just go ahead and do it. Cost me a lot of wounds, though. But um, the next thing is um, church community and a relational alignment. And that's what I was talking about, the, the a women's alliance. But you need relational alignment. It's not... You have to be in a community with other Christians for worship, equipping and strengthening in the word of God. Be aligned with your leadership. Be a tither and be generous. Um, see Hebrews 
I'll give you, I'll write out these scriptures later, but so many charismatic Christians lack in these areas and suffer defeat and loss because they are not in communion or in alignment with spiritual leaders. And I think it's so important about who you align yourself with too. Because one of the things that I have seen is that when you are prophetic, sometimes people align themselves with you, especially when you're in a church setting, to really shut you down. If they can come close to you, like um, they say, keep your, in, your enemies close, your friends close, but your enemies closer. If they can come and get really close to you and get under your skin or get into your emotions or in your head, they can shut you down. And so many prophets don't function in the prophetic because uh, they feel like they're sinning against God or they're doing something wrong or they're breaking rank or they're not following orders. And I decree that that is breaking off of the prophetic office, especially the female prophetic office, because in, in Hebrew text, there is no word prophetess. The word is just prophet. It's, you're a prophet, whether you're a male or female, because God doesn't see male or female. You're, a, you're just a prophet. And so now we're going to look into spiritual mapping. The first thing, so spiritual mapping is first you determine like, where has God called you? He could, he could call you into a specific um, profession. Um, we, we all are assigned to different regions and territories and, and areas. I remember one of my mentors told me, he said, one of the prophet's responsibility in, in an area they're assigned to is to control the traffic in and out of that region. Like in Oklahoma, where I have one of my assignments, I also have a relational alignment in that area. I'm aligned with a pastor in that area. And I saw that one of the one of the largest churches in that area, the pastor just passed away. So that is an opening in the sense that the people may not, we don't know what direction that the ministry is going to go in or who's going to take over the ministry. But a lot of times when a very visible or anointed vessel passes on, it's hard, it's difficult to find somebody to take that position. And so that leaves people open. So that's an area that I'm praying for. That's something that I'm looking at because I'm getting ready to go to Oklahoma in a couple of months to, to do a women's conference. So that's something that I'm praying about. Like, uh, you know, what is there any level of responsibility on my end that needs to happen because that happened? Because he was, he was a big deal. So if we're looking at spiritual mapping, the first thing is um, define the region you are praying for. Determine the borders of the area on that map. Like, what area are you in? So you can start with your own city. Where are those borders? Like, I, I live in a, in a region called the Inland Empire. And so when I first moved out here, and I said I would never move out here because there was nothing out here, but I ended up moving out here. And But when I moved out here, me and a team, we actually mapped out this whole region I wanted to know where the Inland Empire started, where it ended, what were the city, the region borders, who was the police chief, who was who was the fire department, who was the chief of the fire department, what um, council members were here, who were the mayors in each city. I wanted to know what was going on in the city. And then we did, um, we looked at stuff, we'll talk about this later, but I looked at stuff historically to see what was happening. Just had a, a meeting with my pastor about some things that have happened in this region historically too. So the first thing is you are um, developing, you develop the spiritual map of the city, the region, or the nation. And look at what is, and where are the borders? What has happened? The next thing is conduct research and develop the spiritual map. So you want to conduct research, like what happened here? Like I know specifically in the Inland Empire, there is a spirit of racism or division here because the Ku Klux Klan had their headquarters here and so did the Black Panthers have their headquarters here. I know there is there is a spirit of, of an unclean spirit here that manifests itself in sex trafficking because years ago, there were all these children missing, I believe in the early 70s. And before this area was developed, it was more like farmland. This man was kidnapping all these children from the inner city and bringing, him, bringing them to this region. And praise God, he was caught. But look at what's happening. Look, look, look at what's happening, good or bad. I, mean, I know this is a fruitful land because it used to be a lot of, it used to be orange groves and, and lemon groves, so it's fruitful. Um, one of the largest hospital organizations started in this area. So there is an anointing for healing in this area. 
but really look at it. And I would, I would ask, I would start with your city. You know, if you, you're doing some spiritual mapping because you're there, because you're in that city, you have some authority in that city. And so start with your city, do some conducting. We, we, I looked at everything when I came here and I began to pray because I wanted to know, you have to know what you are dealing with when you go into a region. And as God advances all of you, that you want to, you want to be prepared for your assignment. You want to, you don't want to just go into an area. I want to, I've been going to Oklahoma for 17 years now. I've been going to Atlanta for about five years now. My, one of my best friends moved there. So I've been going back and forth to Atlanta every year for about five years. So I'm not, I'm not new to these regions. Um, I've, I've been going like scouting out the land before I ever even did any type of, of spiritual activity. And then Texas, more so for Texas is people that I'm connected to that live in that area that are fly out to see me or that I counsel or coach or something like that. And then my daughter moved there and she moved out. She's back in California. The next thing is compile your data, create a detailed report of your findings. Um, so you can look at all your stuff. You can look at all the mayors, all the police chiefs, all the fire departments, all the things that have happened. What's the murder rate? You know, what good has happened there? Um, what's happening, um, you know, from a development standpoint, like I, when I first started it, I knew that this region was going to grow significantly in the next 10 years. And I've been here for about 10 years now. And I've seen a lot of growth because there's this is a hub for trucks. Truckers come through here. They build a lot of homes. So really look at what you're, you know, when you get to that place in your ministry, really look at what the land you're living in and what is, is happening. And then the next thing is you're going to build relationships with as many churches as possible in that area. Because as a, I, I always sense that as a prophet, it's not so much that you're just stuck in one church. And I think, I think for comfort, we want to be just a member of one church. But I have relationships with several churches in this area. Um, I go to one church, but my, my pastor told me, he said, Yvonne, I only expect to see you once every six weeks. Like, I don't expect to see you every six, every single week. So make relationships with other churches, other ministries, um, groups, you know, women's groups or, you know, groups of mothers, that type of thing, but start making connections with people. The next thing is um, discern the spirits, look for patterns of sin. Did I put that on there? Yeah. Go over there. I said, yeah, look for patterns of sin, seek to identify the spirits that are associated with the data that is compiled. Um, because the goal is you want to dethrone the strong man that reigns over a city, a region, or a nation. One, this one prophet was talking about up in Northern California, there was a city where it was just pretty much abandoned. You know, it was a lot of poverty. The houses were, you know, a lot of the houses were abandoned and stuff. And they went into that area and they started praying. Now it's one of the most prosperous cities in the Northern California area. And so we do have the power to overthrow city, demonic powers over cities, because the only reason they're there, and this is as we grow and elevate all of us, me too, I don't feel like I'm completely there either, but we do have authority over demonic powers and spirits. They, they remain in areas because they're given permission to main, remain in areas. The next thing is breaking strongholds. Breaking, breaking strongholds, entrenchments, demonic powers over the area. Develop a spirit-led prayer strategy that addresses the findings in the data. Go out in the field and do the work. If there's an area where you see a lot of abortion clinics, you know what you're dealing with. I remember I was living in a city when my kids were younger, and it was very much like a home family town. You know, it was very family-oriented, but Planned Parenthood was opening up a um, couple of miles from my home, they were opening up an abortion clinic. And I remember, and my kids remember this, because we would get up, I would take them to school early, but God told me, you, you, I want you to march around that building. I, watched, I marched around that building for weeks, and I never thought about it again. But do you know that clinic never opened? I said, God, this abortion clinic is a violation to the city. This is a, a family city where families come and, and kids go to school and it's very family oriented. 
that clinic never opened. And that building, and my kids even remember this. They're like, mom, remember you used to walk around that building? I would get literally out of my car and walk around that building. And that building stood abandoned for many, many years. And then finally it was torn down. And so we have authority and, and we especially have authority when God speaks to us and tells us to do something. You have control as a prophet, you have control over the region in which you live. If you see a lot of kids that are struggling with ADD or autism or something, that's a spirit. And you have authority over that spirit. And you see a lot of poverty, like in LA, you see a lot of down on Skid, is a place called Skid Row. It's just this three block, four block region where it just, all the homeless people live, they're addicted. But my sister was down there for years and we were, she was sharing with me that the majority of those people down there have been molested. And so the, the state just throws them into this one little region and just piles them up over there and it's just tents and stuff everywhere. And we see that in every city, but that's an area where, where um, God has raised the people to go into that area and minister to these people and set them free. My sister was down there for a long time. And in my, in my heart, I just thought she was going to die down there. We would never know. And we would just never see her again. But I remember the Holy Spirit said, you know, you pray for her. It's not too late. And I prayed for her. And I, and it, I didn't believe God that it wasn't too late. It, I just said, okay, God, that's what you say. Then that's what I'm coming in agreement with it. But did I feel like it was too late? I, in my heart, I felt like it was too late. But I just started, I remember God convicted me again. He says, not too late. And I started praying for her. And so every time she would come up in my spirit, I would pray for her and pray for her healing and deliverance. My sister was addicted to drugs for 40 years. And she called me, she hit me up on Facebook a couple of weeks ago and we reconnected and she's, she's clean and she has her own place and all that kind of stuff. And God brought deliverance. So there's nothing there's no area that you don't have control over. If you have a burden for it, you have an anointing for it. Because God would not give you a burden without an anointing. And the next thing is be wise and be prepared for pushback. There are times that you may have to step back a minute because something may blindside you because maybe you may, you may need to do a little bit more research. You can think maybe you're dealing with a spirit of addiction or people that are bound by addiction where you could be like with in my sister's situation because my sister was molested by a teacher we trusted and he molested her and we opened our my mom opened our home to him and he asked could he take um her on a motorcycle ride one day and of course she trusted him because we had known him for a long time he worked in our daycare and all that kind of stuff and he molested her and she was never really the same after that she ran away and she she just struggled for the rest of her you know got pregnant early all that type of stuff but there's always going to be a level of pushback because the enemy does not want you to, to dis dethrone him or dislodge his activity. But that's how you can, that's how when pushback comes, you can come back and, and come to somebody and get a little bit, do a little bit more research or come in agreement where the one thing about coming in relationship with people is there may be people that have the same burden that you have. And rather than you doing all the, the heavy lifting, you come in agreement with them. Like I know where I live, there is a heavy spirit of religion. It's a very religious spirit. They want to go to, a lot of them want to go to church, but they don't want a move of God because that's something that a religious spirit cannot control. Like the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they were mad at Jesus because he was healing the people and crowds were forming because they wanted a touch from God. They were so upset about that. And one region would, one passage where it says that Jesus went to the temple to throw over the tables. It says the Sadducees and Pharisees, that they were, um, what's the term they said, that they were conspiring in their hearts what they could do to Jesus. Because religious and political spirits don't want people free. Freedom and liberty is not what they want. But the Bible says where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty. The next thing is look for discernible change. Like for me, the fact that that concerning that um, that building, that Planned Parenthood, the discernible the discernible change for me is that that building never opened. It literally stopped production in midstream. 
It just stopped. They were working on it and then nothing else happened after that. That was a discernible change. The last thing is, uh, the next thing is look for, oh, I said that, and the last thing is look to the future. Because sometimes you can be, you can be working on a situation where, where the, you have already been delivered. Like after I walked around that building for those weeks, never thought about it again. I had been released from that assignment and the work in the spirit had already been done. And it just, it was just shut down and it never happened. And so look to the future. So now there's like a, a fruit store there or something. And I think, yeah, that is the last slide. Yes, ma'am. So any questions? Okay, nice. Hello. Hi, Kim. How are you? Hi. <laughs> how are you doing? Yeah, sorry, I missed you in Atlanta. Yeah, my brother and his wife came in out of town. Oh, I'll be back. I would love to connect with you. Yes, yes. I'm so sorry. Oh, so, no, no, no. You're going to be sorry. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. Number one, one of the things I keep, and I'm in a point where I'm getting a lot of messages, mm -hmm. but I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> I don't you know how like to answer. Messages to preach? Yeah, so I'll, I'll get words. It's like I'll get even, I've never been, I can preach, but I've never been one to really preach. Mm -hmm. um, I come off preachy in my conversations, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when it comes up upon me. And um, I keep hearing that God, like, um, and you touched on it in, in this talk, where he's like, Kim, you have to get in order. So a number of things was like, um, like with you, I hope you don't mind. I don't have a church home. So I've been I'm tithing into your ministry mm -hmm. because he's yeah, like, well, you, you got to You got to get in order. So I'm like, okay, what does that necessarily mean? What does, what is that required of a prophet? That's not, you know, I'm not the most, God's still working on some of my fleshly um, ways. All of, still us growing. All of us. <laughs> no, we are mere mortals and we will, God says that we will be perfect when mortality takes on immortality. So we're, none of us are perfect. You know, I just learned that in my imperfection, keep moving forward. I don't let, allow guilt or condemnation to um, overtake me. Yeah. You know, because yeah. we are human beings, people. <laughs> and so yeah, just right. it's either way. I just, you know, I keep getting pushed and I said, okay, so from, I don't know if you can kind of give me some insight on what is the order of a prophet, especially when you don't have a church home, because that's the one thing that's the most pressing with me is being just in order because I just, it's like, I'm fearful to have any doorways or open, you know, open territories for the enemy to come in to be able to do what I need to do. Okay, so when we look at biblical texts, if we look at the biblical text, the prophets answered to God. They were not part of the church structure. You had the priest, you had the, you know, the priest that took care of the thing, the temple and all that kind of stuff. But prophets were called on by God. Now, I'm not, I'm not against church. I had to find a church. I was actually trained by a prophet that did not believe in female prophets. And so I was just dying on the vine and quote unquote, trying to stay in order. And God spoke to me one day and told me to do a conference. And I got in a whole lot of trouble for doing that. But I know that I obeyed God. So when we talk about order, are we talking about man-made order or biblical structure? I think that if you can connect yourself and I, and we've talked about this, that I'm open to cover you and I'm covered apostolically. Like one of the things that the, 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 my pastor has a burden for, he has a teaching called the fivefold female, which we're going to have to get that out and, and get that done. But I'm open to cover you. I'm covered and bring you up under that until God does send you to a church home. But a lot of times in church settings, they, they, there is no room for prophets. Even I remember being in a church where they knew I was a prophet, 
I was a house prophet, but the moment the pastor started doing something wrong, um, they didn't want me there anymore. He said, I'll never have another prophet in this church. So, you know, I, I think it's a hit or miss when it comes to church. And, and I was talking to some people down in Atlanta and they said, there's not a lot of room for prophetic ministry in that area. And so I don't know how true that is. That was their perception is that that is how they felt. And so I think for you, being in order is being, if we say order, quote unquote order, is, is finding somebody you can be accountable to. And the other thing about the, the messages that God gives you, start a podcast. Okay. Yeah, and I would say with whoever said that, because I was going to ask you, do you know of anyone in Atlanta? Because that is a very true statement. There is not, it's not accepted. It's frowned upon. Wow. Um, my last my last bishop when I was a um I've had a bishop an apostle um I've usually sat up underneath prophets and I've come to find that usually I'm either used or muzzled quickly um my bishop I didn't even I knew I operated I just thought I had strong discernment or mm -hmm. I just um could get a word um but one day he was very solemn just very open he was in a week kind of a weak moment he looked up at me and he says Kimberly do you know who the true prophet of this house is mm. and I was like well well you know you bishop whatever and he looked at me he says no actually it's you mm. and that was one of the first times I actually got like that kind of outspoken um confirmation from someone else I've mm -hmm. heard it in my family but you know it's different when it comes from my outside mm -hmm. and then I sat um, under an apostle and then the last person that I was under that's how I ended up finding you uh, through Miss Gloria, because the last person she she ran me rugged, and she was a, a prophet. I mean, mm -hmm. and this you know very mature in it, and it kind of just gave me a very bitter taste, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know. Um, and what to do in Atlanta? It's just not they either very covetous, um, or it's a particular uh, uh, a type of prophecy that goes on in this region. It's mm -hmm. not. How God deal with me, and I, I I don't know any other word of saying it, but I'm more of a Deborah's like doom or gloom. Like I come and I bring warning. That's what mm -hmm. I get. Mm -hmm. It's like death is coming, destruction is coming. This is what we have to do. Repent. I don't do a lot of that other stuff that they do. Mm -hmm. So usually that was frowned upon because <laughs> it's never nothing really uh cozy. Yeah. But that's how God deals with you. That's how he deals with you. But I do believe that there are, there is a people and we can talk about that offline. Um, okay. Like with my pastor, I run stuff by him. If I feel like, hey, God's showing me this, I kind of run stuff by him. You know, what does that look like? You know, I try to write my stuff down and date it and want to be better than that. Like when God really shows me stuff, I, you know, I'm more of a like, like I was sharing with my pastor today, I'm more like a Peter that I will cut off your ear before I ask questions. You know, that right. type of thing. So I um, I tend to be a lot, a very like what the Bible calls exhortive, you know, move you to action. Like take, this needs to stop, stop, stop. And we need to do this. That's tend to be how I move to in a public setting, um, in a preaching arena to urge people to action. And that is kind of frowned upon because people have gotten so used to like God was showing me this morning that people just want to be pregnant, but they don't want the responsibility of, of managing a relationship. They want to get a good word from God and, and this is going to happen and this is going, but they don't want the responsibility of what needs to change in your life in order for that thing to happen. It's like a drive by. They want, they want um, drive by prophecy. Okay. And my last question is this, so, and it's funny you had touched on it and being yet come to Atlanta, I wanted to talk to you about it more privately but <laughs> yeah we can my talk back... online okay um, you have my yeah just we can um you can just text me your number and we can chat okay mm -hmm. okay okay but i'm going to be coming back to atlanta too because i i am feeling a pull there so i'm going to be coming back there's about five women there right now that I, we can meet and my best friend lives there too so we can find some place to meet and just really you know See what God does. I believe he's going to do something significant. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Hi, Miss Katrina. Hi, I was going to ask Kimberly. Kimberly, um, 
What city do you live in in uh, in uh, Atlanta and Georgia? The heart. I'm right in Atlanta, like <laughs> right in the dad smack in the middle of Atlanta. Because I was going to mm -hmm. say I know somebody way out of Snailville, but that's that's way too far. Yeah. When you say in the heart, what street? Like you in? You in she's in you in Atlanta. Oh, you off 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 of uh. Mm, what's what's part by? Lithonia or by the airport? Where where are you at? Oh no no no. Um, let me give you a middle point. Let's just say I'm from the aquarium to the Georgia Dome okay. to oh. the underground. I'm literally in the middle of all that. So I'm okay. off of Boulevard and uh, yeah. Peachtree, so to speak. Oh, so, oh, I was at the Coca Cola Museum. You right in there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was right there. Yeah, I have okay. a I have a loft down in it. We call it Cabbage Town, but I'm uh, it's a land. Oh, oh, I like where you are. Mm -hmm. I know exactly where you're. Uh, Yvonne, yeah. are you going to be coming doing anything in Texas? I need to, right? Yeah, you know what? Well, we just wait. Yeah, let's. I let's see talk about that offline. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Yeah, because because I have a conference coming up at the end of February, and like ten people are coming in from Texas. Um. Okay, so the conference in April. That's in Oklahoma. Yeah, the conference. So I'm doing a conference called Deborah and Esther Rising. And so February here in Inland Empire, and then April in Oklahoma. Okay. You, do you have people coming from um, from Texas in April to Oklahoma? I need to. I need to probably. Yeah. Put a four hour drive, I think. How about mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. Okay. You know, one of the speakers coming in. So. Yeah. Okay. So. Exciting. Okay, so when when can I um, talk to you offline? Oh, we can talk tomorrow. Just um okay. Um, message me your number because I feel like I need to find a place to just meet or grab a little room or something. We'll find something. I'm not too fancy, but I do believe that I, I just feel like that we all have to make sure that we fulfill the call of God on our lives. You know yeah. that that that's important that we. Make sure that we're doing what we were sent here to do. Yeah, and that's and important. just FYI, FYI, I can host if it's like five to ten people. I can host in my loft. Okay, because I have a whole okay. yeah. So you don't have to worry about getting a. Mm -hmm. I know it's hard in COVID trying to get something, so mm -hmm. I can definitely host. Okay, but I am definitely going to do that. Um, prophetic woman's alliance that, like that's a definite like I'm going to spend the rest of February just like kind of you know retweaking what I do and tightening up some of the things I've done it's taken me about five years to get to this place honestly and but definitely know that there's such a need for that and when I say that that's going to be an alliance like we will meet like once a week and um, my pastor who's apostolic so I'm under like the same covering as um it's called h-i-m so with um james gall chuck pierce all those people that's kind of the flow that we're in it's new for me but that's the flow that we're in so um he's very very well versed in the word of god i met him supernaturally you know he got a copy of my book and that's how i met him so i started coming here and I wasn't sold. I mean, I was like, oh, okay. You know, we go to millions of churches and be like, oh, okay, God, you know, but it just, he just started building a relationship. And I just, I just um, got hired on as the pastor of the supernatural. So I will be managing all the um, healing ministries that are in this church. So he's a really good guy, loves women, cares about women in ministry, you know, very well versed, finishing, finishing up his doctorate degree. So, and he has a heart, such a heart for women, which you don't find that, you don't find that a lot, you know? And so he would be some, doing some of the teaching and some of the training and stuff like that. Shoot, I think it's, that's important. So yeah, we're gonna work all this stuff out, it's exciting. And then let's talk, Patrina, about Texas. Definitely for sure. Well, I love you guys. Oh, oh go ahead, Gloria. <laughs> okay. Um, 
All right, it's, it's coming up on Valentine's Day. That's when I got my first prophecy ever. And this prophecy, after I got it, I went through like 20 years of probably up and down, like a lot of hell on earth. Mm -hmm. But uh, the prophecy was, is that I, that I had a double portion, okay, mm -hmm. that I had to joy the Lord. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then on Easter, Easter Sunday, uh, it was the first time I ever fell out in the spirit and I felt mm. like uh, uh, warm oil came on, on top of the top, the crown of my head to my forehead and it came on there twice. Mm. Okay, so I'm not like, uh, my, I, you know, so I've always doubted being, you know, uh, actually being a prophet or being because of, uh, but the only thing I had to stand on was that prophecy that I was given. But my dominant uh, gifts are discernment, healing, and word of knowledge. Praise God. So when I say that, I could be standing next to a person and I feel like I'm having a heart attack. And it took me years to realize that it wasn't me feeling what mm -hmm. I was feeling. Absolutely. And I would call that person up and I would ask them, do you have problems with your heart? And, and this will be somebody I've never met before. I was at, at a conference uh, in, uh, in Orlando like two years ago. I mean, this, me and this young lady stood out there to two o'clock in the morning talking and I felt like I was dying. And so the next week I called and I asked her and she began to tell me about all of the operations she was having and all of the things that mm -hmm. were going on with her body and it was all about her heart. So, and then the healings, uh, I've got so many, it's been so many miraculous healings that I've actually done in the church outside. And it, I'm always shocked because I'm like, you know, because I know it's not me. So I'm just saying my, so I'm not the type of prophet where I, you know, I can just, well, I'm not a fortune teller prophet right. <laughs> and I'm not saying anybody else is, but yeah. that's not. So it, would that be in the same group as a prophet? I Absolutely. mean, based on the, the prophecy yeah. and and how and how my uh, my giftings work mm -hmm. that God has given me. With okay, yeah, because prophets, I see prophets operate heavily in healing ministries, um, words of wisdom, words of knowledge. You know, prophecy is true. Prophecy is really a foretelling of something, a future event, but very heavily in words of wisdom, words of knowledge break open the wisdom of God to people, you know, um, move people in the direction of purpose and destiny. Like I remember being at a, a, uh, in a Bath and Body Works and there was a young girl there and I asked her, I said, God told me to ask her, what was her dream? And she said, I want to be a police officer. I said, well, God said, follow your dream. And she just started weeping. So moving people in the, in the direction of destiny and stuff like that. Because we have to remember that in the Old Testament, the, the saints did, they weren't saints. In the Old Testament, the people of God did not have the Holy Spirit. In New Testament prophetics, edification, edification, exhortation, and comfort, people are filled with the Holy Spirit. So a lot of times we bring confirmation more than we bring information to a person. So that's, that's the difference of being in the New Testament that we are an extension of Christ's ministry like we all are, but more revelatory. Prophets operate under the, the realm of revelation. So absolutely. Did that help, Miss Gloria? Yeah, yes, yes, that, that, that really helps. Uh... Yeah, uh, thank you so much. You're welcome. Yep, I was like, I'm, I'm like, I'm like you always say, you know, as as uh, individuals that are different, we always feel you feel different, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like you just don't fit in anywhere. And absolutely, and uh, it's just nice to know that all of our our gifts, even though we're we have that uh, anointing to be prophets, that they're different. They're yeah. not all basically the same, but they're they're different. And, and I wrote a book, it's called Healing the Wounds, Prophetic Leadership Transformed. So it explains all of that. Like what does prophecy look like now? And healing wounds and trauma and stuff like that. So. Okay. But I love you guys. This is the last class and um, make oh. sure you guys, you guys are all part of my mailing list and I will be being more fervent in doing videos and 
sending out blogs and emails and stuff like that, but there's some stuff coming up I think is necessary. I try to, I try to, and all of us do, just lean into what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. And my old corporate boss used to tell me all the time, work harder, not smarter, because we are not part of this generation of social media um, influencers. That's not who we are. We have a word from the Lord, and it is just an avenue in which God can use us to minister to the body of Christ. Amen. So I love you. Um, Patrina, I'll Amen. be talking to you. Kim, I'll be talking to you. Gloria, reach out to me if you need me. You guys all have my email and stuff like that, and I'll be sending some information out. Okay, thank you. I can't hear you. You're... <laughs> Will we still be able to go and look at some of the information to this one? Oh, yeah, it's going to stay up. Okay, guys, God bless you. Thank you. God bless.